our speaker for this afternoon is Dr. Michelle May J. Olvido. She's currently the board and university secretary, at the same time, the executive assistant to the president. She graduated with the award Best in Dissertation in her Doctor of Philosophy in Education, major in Research and Evaluation, and Master of Arts in Education with concentration in Mathematics. She also graduated Mania Cum Laude in her Bachelor in Elementary Education, major in General Education, and garnered third place during the October 2019 licensure examination for teachers. She, according to the papers that she published and all her research work, our speaker is expert on enabling teaching and learning and also educational administration and management and is advocating for development of research culture in the academe. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Michelle May J. Olvido. A round, a round of applause, please. So, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Garcia. Thank you very much for that introduction. However, this afternoon, I will not be talking about uh, how to survive being single or anything related to that. But this afternoon, I will be talking about um, interactive module development. Specifically, this is a guide to writing self-learning modules. So I hope that this um, session will help all those who are attending this webinar to feel better prepared to answer the needs of our learners, especially in this time of pandemic. So let us start. So let us first um, set the tone for our discussion this afternoon. We ask ourselves the question, why are we learning how to write self-learning modules? So we are faced with a reality. I would like to share um, the, the report of the CNU COVID-19 Task Force, wherein we realize that the pandemic or COVID-19 has caused unprecedented disruptions economically, socially, politically, and academically. That means that this pandemic is not just a health crisis, it has also led to an educational crisis. Academic continuity during the lockdown or the enhanced community quarantine has been a challenge for teachers and students since most universities are used to face-to-face -to -face, uh, face -face delivery and that includes Cebu Normal University. The pandemic has created a new reality that educational institutions have to grapple with. So the challenge, therefore, is for Cebu Normal University to reframe in the context of the new normal that has changed the landscape of education, not just in the Philippines, but in the whole world. So when we talk about reframing, what do we mean by that? So according to Bowman and Deal in 2017, to reframe is to look at the same thing from multiple lenses or points of view. When the world is hopelessly confusing, reframing is a powerful tool for gaining clarity, regaining balance, generating new questions, and finding options that make a difference. So the beautiful thing about reframing is that we are not asked to change totally uh, what we teach, but rather to look at our courses, to look at our degree programs, to look at what we offer from another point of view, specifically, from the point of view of our students who are trying to overcome the challenge of this pandemic. So the response of the university is flexible learning. It is a learner-centered approach to education that covers a range of delivery modes, including distance education, mixed mode delivery, e-learning, online learning, self-paced and self-directed learning. So if you were here during the first webinar, Dr. Kassan and Dr. Inoshan were very comprehensive in the discussion of the different learning theories and the different un theoretical underpinnings of flexible learning. They even went um, to the theories and underpinnings for module development and the different meaningful tasks that could be done remotely. So my 
discussion this afternoon is more of the practical side, the actual writing and the developing of the self-learning module. If you look at the flexible learning um, approach, it includes e-learning there. But according to the Commonwealth of Learning, given the uneven development of technologies in various countries, online learning cannot be seen as the only solution for remote, rural, and resource-poor communities. So yesterday, we had a webinar on, in Google Classroom about Google Classroom. And I noticed that there are really many of the faculty members that have shared their feedback that Google Classroom has limitations because we have to consider the connectivity of our students and even our faculty. And thus, the university is trying to give all possible capacity building activities for the faculty members to have options on how to ensure academic activity continuity, even in this time of pandemic. So again, we ask, why are we learning how to write self-learning modules. We are learning how to write self-learning modules so that we will still be able to teach our students despite the challenges of the pandemic. So we say that this is the new normal, but at the end of the day, the core of education is still the same. Some things do not change, and that is that at the center of the educational process is and always will be the student. So we capacitate ourselves, not just so that we will be capacitated, but so that we can become the teachers that our students need. And I hope that this session will leave you feeling more confident that you can still be the effective teacher that our students need. So to start, I would like to set the learning compass for the activity or for the webinar this afternoon. And that is at the end of this webinar, the participants will be able to explain the steps in developing a learning module, a self-learning module, give the function of the different parts of the self-learning module, and discuss some tips on effective writing as applied to self-learning modules. So the main question that we, I would like for us to answer in this afternoon's webinar is this, how do we write? effective self-learning modules. So let us begin with a short activity. So let's read the paragraphs below and answer the questions that follow. So I will read and you can listen, especially if your internet connectivity does not allow you to look at this in the video format. So the first example goes like this. Classical conditioning is a fundamental associative learning process developed by Ivan P. Pavlov. His research into the physiology of digestion led him logically to create the science of conditioned reflexes. Classical conditioning refers to learning that occurs when a neutral stimulus, for example, a sound, becomes associated with a stimulus, for example, food, that naturally produces a behavior. To take an example, a person may start to salivate in the presence of his or her favorite food. In relation, hearing a bell sound may not cause any reaction to the person hearing the sound. However, repeated exposures to these two forms of stimulus may create a certain association, and after the association is learned, the previously neutral stimulus is sufficient to produce the behavior. Simply put, it can be defined as a type of learning in which a stimulus acquires the capacity to evoke a reflexive response that was originally evoked by a different stimulus. That's example A. Now let's go to example B. Example B goes like this. Let us start this lesson with a story. Carl's mother would always come home from work with delicious food contained in a brown paper bag. The sight of food would make Carl's stomach growl, reminding him of how hungry he was. Because this happened so often, there came a point when the sight of the paper bag alone would make his stomach crumble. Have you ever had a similar experience? When a thing, person, place, or event elicits a response out of constant association to something else, and not because of natural causes, this can be considered as a conditioned reflex. Ivan P. Pavlov developed a theory of learning 
anchored on fundamental associative learning processes, which he called classical conditioning. Classical conditioning refers to learning that occurs when a neutral stimulus, for example, sound, becomes associated with a stimulus, for example, food, that naturally produces a behavior. So now let's try to answer some questions. You don't have to answer out loud, but allow me to just um, expo to allow me to guide you through this process. So the first question goes like this: How are the paragraphs similar? Okay, so you may think that um, the paragraphs are similar because both of them talk about classical conditioning. Some students, uh, being philosophers themselves, would say both paragraphs are similar because they are composed of words. They are all indented. The title is in bold. So all of those answers are also correct. But of course, we are hoping that they would say that those two paragraphs actually talk about the same thing. But how are the paragraphs different? That's the second question. The first thing you will notice, and I hope you notice it too, is the manner of writing. So there is a different attack for example A and for example B. We are not here to judge whether A is better than B, but I think we can all agree that A and B serve different functions. So when we try to develop a learning module, we are not trying to say that a module is better than a textbook or an internet um, source, but rather when we make a module, it serves a different function from the other learning kits that are available. So we go to question number three now. Which paragraph do you think has been taken from a self-learning module? So all of us being educators, we can easily point out that Letter B, the, or the second example, would most likely have been taken from a self-learning module. And uh, example A is a paragraph that has been taken from a typical textbook. So I would say typical, since there are also many textbooks right now that have a modular format. So, but if you remember um, textbooks, how textbooks are originally arranged, then paragraph A would be a typical textbook. So, considering the sample paragraphs, what do you think is a self-learning module? And what are its key attributes that make it different from a textbook? So this way of presentation, so I would like to say beforehand that my manner of presentation this afternoon is arranged in such a way so that I can demonstrate how this discussion of this unit of learning can be translated to a self-learning module. That means at the end of this webinar, I will also be sharing with you a self-learning module that I made to help you write a self-learning module. So if you notice, there are so many questions and it evokes a response even in the minds of the learners. So we don't have to spoon feed everything. So let's dig deeper. So what then is a self-learning module? So there are so many definitions and I just took one. Russell defines module as an instructional package dealing with a single conceptual unit of subject matter. And self-learning modules allow the learner to learn at their pace and acquire knowledge, skills, and attitudes in the absence of a teacher. Now, we, I take a pause here and I would like to highlight that number one, a, self, a module has a single conceptual unit of subject matter. That means one of the major decisions that a teacher has to make before he or she would write a learning module is to limit the discussion for every single unit because we do not want to overwhelm our students. And the second point that I would like to highlight from this definition is that we have to create self-learning modules that would allow our learners to learn even in the absence of a teacher. And so there are many who would start to say that it is quite difficult to write a self-learning module. And I agree with that simply because, and I would like to share this perspective, it is a challenge to write a self-learning module because you are trying to replace you. So um, if we're just trying to replace a source of content, or knowledge, our students can simply go to Google. If we're trying to replace someone teaching skills, our students can go to YouTube, for example. But since a self-learning module is trying to represent or replace you as a teacher, 
then that is the reason for the difficulty. So we can say um, that if you are easily replaceable, then it's not difficult to write a learning module. So when you say it's difficult to write a module, that's because you are not easily replaced. So let's just to continue. Uh, let's continue. So what are the difference between typical textbooks and modules? So number one, a typical textbook assumes interest, while a module arouses the interest. And that is why there are many modules that ask questions first. Second, the typical textbook is usual, sorry, usually written for the use of the teacher, while modules are written for the use of the learner. The typical textbook has no indication of study time, while modules give estimates for study time. So some modules would say that this unit is good for three hours, this unit is good for one and a half hours. So that also would allow us to estimate how long it would take our students to fulfill all the tasks that we have placed in that module. Another difference is that in a technical textbook, the reader's views are seldom sought, while in modules, we encourage evaluation of the content of the module for evaluation and also for improvement. A typical textbook is designed for a wide market, while modules are designed for a particular audience. So when you say a module, you say if it's for a third year college um, class, then the manner of writing is especially for that group of audience. So when a teacher who has been teaching for let's say 10 or 15 years would pick up that module, he or she might find that module very easy to do because that module wasn't designed for him or her. And then to continue, a typical textbook rarely, although we see textbooks now that state this, but before it, it rarely states aims and objectives. However, for modules, they always give the aims and the objectives. So the typical textbook also has dense content. But for modules, content is unpacked. The typical de textbook has a dense layout, while modules are more open in their layout. If you notice, module, usually modules have um, big spaces in between sentences. They allow for larger margins, so that when a student looks at it, um, the page alone, the face uh, quality of the module alone, he or she will not be overwhelmed that there's so much or so many words in a single page. So for typical textbooks, there are no study skills advice, but for modules, usually there are study skills advice. So like you're asked, um, uh, the, the module writer might say that for this section, you will be asked to analyze or this will test your skills on problem solving. So they advise on what skills may be utilized in sections of that module. For typical textbooks, you can read it passively, but modules requires active response. So there are more questions, there are more activities to be answered. And a typical textbook aims at a scholarly presentation, while modules aim at successful teaching and learning. So the test of a module is how successful the learner is in achieving the learning outcomes set by that module. So again, we go back. How do we write effective self-learning modules? So we keep in mind, just from that short discussion, that effective self-learning modules are written in a manner and structure that allow students to achieve intended learning outcomes with little or no help from their sorry, that's from, from their teachers. So now as we move forward, we will look at the manner and structure by which these modules are done. And we will try to think about the courses that we will be teaching and try to identify what are really the intended learning outcomes that we can present in a modular format. Because the self-learning module is not also applicable to all units of learning, especially when it is very complicated and the the highlight here for a self you can never call it a self-learning module if it does not meet this criteria or criterion which means the students will be able to learn with little or no help from their teachers so how do we design and develop modules so this the steps there are so many steps 
in designing and developing modules, but this one we anchored from the presentation of Taa and Makalde from Simeo Inotech. So here we have the first step is we conduct a research on the requirements of the self-learning module. The second is we assess the project risks. Third, we design the module and then we plan the content. Fourth, we develop the module. And then the fifth one is we evaluate and design the development, sorry, evaluate the design and development process. So when I discuss this, I will only choose highlights from every step because my assumption in this webinar is that all of us have been teaching for quite some time and I think some of us have already made um, self-learning modules already and so I will not discuss some pointers that, uh, very thoroughly if I feel that this is something that you already know. So the first step is conduct a research on the module requirements. When I say research, this is not referring to a full-blown research, meaning that you're required to produce a research paper, but rather it is grounded on evidence. So like for example, in the university, when we did the reframing for the new normal, we, just, we didn't um, create it out of thin air. We conducted many surveys and we interviewed students. We asked the faculty, we had a series of meetings and that is part of evidence-based um, decision-making no, in the university. And I know that teachers like you and I, we do not make decisions from thin air. We also do our research. We look for evidence. So the first question we ask is what type of module are we planning to make? So for example, self-learning. So at the back of our minds, we're constantly thinking that my students will learn even if I am not there. My students will learn even if I am not there. So second is we have to look at the characteristics of our target users. Now, I would like to expound on this. So I attended very recently a training on just a short webinar on social media marketing. And it was shared there that, for example, you know, it is very popular now for our young um, learners, no? even as young as elementary, they know vloggers and bloggers. So if you were here early, you would know that the beat that we are we were playing was a very popular beat in TikTok. Okay, so I'm sure some of you have even danced it on TikTok already. So why am I sharing that? Because apparently when you decide to become a vlogger or a blogger, you just don't make videos out of thin air. In a formal course, so meaning there is really a course if you want to take this seriously because people earn money from blogging and vlogging, that when you go through the course, you will be asked to identify the very specific characteristics of your target users. So it is not enough to say that my audience, my audience for this blog are young people. That is insufficient. So just to give you an example, if I were to decide to make a vlog or a blog about Korean drama, which I am very much a fan of, it is not enough to say that my target audience are those who watch Korean drama. That is not sufficient. I would have to be very specific. I would say uh, my target audience will be uh, single ladies, from 27 years old to 35 years old, who work an 8 a.m. to a 5 p.m. job, who watch K-dramas at night or during the weekend. So I have identified very specific characteristics. So it may appear meaningless at first, but actually that has implications. So if that is my target audience, then I would, I, the specific audience is female, then my choice of words would also be directed to a female audience. And also because I have identified a specific behavior pattern, for example, they work from eight to five, then when I post my vlog, I have to post it around 5.30 or six, because that's the time that they get off work. So I will not post anything from eight to five. Now, how will that apply? To those making a self-learning module. So for example, if I were to make a self-learning module for um, introduction to research, which I think is offered in second year or third year, depending on the degree program, 
it is not enough for me to say that my target users are um, from age 18 to 20 years old. I would really have to extend my imagination and look at also my experience with my students if I've been teaching the subject for a long time. I would have to say that um, I would be teaching um, students second year to third year, 18 to 20, who live in a place with limited internet connectivity, let's say, just for example's sake, um, these students live in Liloan. So there's, sometimes there's connection, sometimes there's no connection. And they also live with their parents who will most likely ask them to help with household chores. So when I extend my imagination about my target users just a little bit, that will give more um, implications to the way I design my module. Number one, they have so many distractions. So they live with their parents, they'll be asked to do chores, they have limited internet connectivity. So that will tell me I really have to make my module very interesting. It has to be meaning, not only interesting, but it has to be very meaningful. So sometimes our students do not do our activities, not because they are lazy students, but there are also students who put them aside because they do not see meaning or they do not find meaning in the activity that is being done. So that is just one of the many things that I would like to highlight. And then we continue on to read on the learning needs of our users, our learning environment, and of course, our ethical and legal considerations. So this would include our choice of language, proper referencing so that there will be no copyright issues, et cetera, et cetera. Even um, when you consider the images that we use, then we have to look into um, the copyright of those images. So sometimes if, if you are also good in photography, you can take your own um, pictures so that there will be no copyright issues. Okay, so that's also one consideration. Second is when we write a self-learning module, we also have to assess our project risks, meaning you have to identify the risks. So what are the examples of the risks? When you ask your students to do an interview, now, considering this pandemic, are you asking them to leave their homes? Uh, so those are just some of the risks that you could consider in your choice of activities, in your choice of words, etc. So we determine the likelihood of the consequence. We also have make decisions about whether the risk is acceptable or not. So when the risk is unacceptable, we have to treat it. But even if the risk is acceptable, because there is no... I don't think we can make a decision where we can guarantee that it is risk-free. Even if there is just a tiny amount of risk, we still have to monitor and review the risk, okay? So moving forward, we also have, we now go to designing the module and planning the content. So based on the research that you have done, generate a range of design options. So how do I design my course? So every course has specific peculiarities. So even if I give an example later on for a self-learning module, I will never tell you to follow it, um, follow everything, no? because every degree program and every course have peculiarities in the same manner that every teacher has peculiarities in the way he or she would teach. However, I think we can all agree that there is a common ground that we can work on. No? So we can focus on that common ground and design according to that common ground without also sacrificing the differences of every course, the demands of every program, and the art and the science that every teacher possesses, okay, in the area of teaching. Second is part of the design is we have to identify implications of each design. So if you design your course as standalone, the module stands alone, then the student do not need to access um, a website, will not need to download something else. So that's also one design. But then if you ask the student, let's say, you design a module, however you suggest, or there are options that they have to go to their Google Classroom. So you have to think of implications as well. So there are, of course, a variety of choices. And then we are just asked to think more deeply about each choice that we make. And then we, of course, decide on the design. 
this is very important because some teachers, like me sometimes, get so caught up on thinking of how to make the module that you never get to writing the module. So for example, in the personal experience, I am very particular with PowerPoint presentation. So for example, for this presentation alone, it took me about an hour just to choose a PowerPoint layout or design. So that is very counterproductive, no? But that's also one of my weaknesses in a way, not really a weakness, but a peculiarity of mine. So I'm sure you also have your own peculiarity. So regardless of the many choices, there needs to come a point wherein you decide. Because if we keep on thinking, we'd be thinking for five days, two weeks, three weeks, then the next thing we know, it might already be September and we have no ready module. The important thing is that we don't expect the module to be perfect the first time, okay? So there is always, uh, if we tell our students that learning is a process and that they have to trust the process, then we as teachers have to model that. You know? So we have to understand that even if we are teachers, we are still in the process of becoming. So we allow ourselves to make, make wrong choices, but then we fail fast and learn fast. No? So learn fast and um, fail fast, okay? So to continue still on designing the module and planning the content, we have to develop an outline or prototype for the learning resource and confirm it with the client. So when I say confirm with the client, we don't say confirm with every student, but rather, you know, in every institution, there are different ways of quality assurance. So maybe this has to be checked by the chair or checked by the dean or reviewed by the team that is teaching the subject. So there are so many things that we can um, work on. However, the idea here, as I, I have said a while ago, is that when you confirm it with someone else, you subject yourself to the process of really improving the module. So we go back to the very core of why we are designing this module. At the end of the day, it's about the students. So even if there are um, our chair, our dean, our colleague will tell us, you know, maybe this needs improvement. The idea is we have to transcend the error and focus that um, it's okay if I am wrong for this first run or for this first time I'm making it, as long as I am in the direction of making the best module for my students. So at the end of the day, it's really about the students. So that requires great amounts of humility from the module writers and from the teachers who are making the modules. Then we look at the breadth and the depth of the proposed content. So this one I think is very, very important because when you're teaching a subject for a very long time, you would consider that there are so many things that are important to be taught, but then you are forced to ask, which one will I be able to let go? Considering the limitations of this pandemic, the time and my lack of presence to help my students in a face-to-face -face, um, discussion, I will need to let go you know, of some of this proposed content and focus on the very core of my course and at the very core of this degree program, okay? So I think all of us can agree that one of, you know, if we are forcing ourselves to look at a silver lining out of this pandemic, it is that we begin to notice what is truly essential in life, okay? So we see that there are things that bring us joy, but we can live without. And there are things that we really cannot live without. Okay, so in the same manner, when you write a self-learning module, considering that your students are limited in their resources, they're limited in their time, you will be forced to ask which of these courses or which of this content is truly very essential for my students. And which of this, maybe not, I will not say it's not important, but they can learn later on when things are better. No? So we have to determine the breadth and the depth of the proposed content because if we try to cover everything, then our module might be very, very thick and very, very overwhelming. And at the end, our students will leave not feeling that they have accomplished something, okay? And then we write a work plan. 
So we now go to step four, the developing of the module. So we create the content in accordance with the agreed design, curate or modify existing learning materials or develop a new one, so many times I find that when I design a learning module, there are many activities that I already used in class that I just have to put in the module. So in the same manner, if I may relate it to the discussion on the use of Google Classroom yesterday, there were so many teachers that said, um, sir, can I use my existing PowerPoint? Um, sir, can I upload my existing um, seat work or my existing examinations, then the answer to that is yes. So in the same manner, when you write the module, you don't have to come from, uh, you don't have to start from scratch. No? So you can look at all your existing materials and then maybe curate, then choose which ones are still applicable and then you use it for your module. Or sometimes you realize that these things are useful in the past but are not useful anymore in the present. So that means you have to let it go, okay? So sometimes we have to let go of something so that we can welcome new things in our lives. So that also is true for developing a module. And then we have to establish mechanisms for reviewing work in progress. So the beautiful thing about these steps that is, or that was taught to us by Simeo Inotech is that it includes in the steps the need for a constant review of the work, okay? So when you say constant review for the work, you have to come from a place of knowing that this module doesn't have to be perfect the first time. So that leaves us with a feeling of being able to make mistakes, no? And then um, just trying to change for the better. And then to continue, we review the content and the design against client requirement and relevant criteria modify the design and our content when necessary, and then finalize the, out, the output and secure approval. So I'm not sure how the university will go about uh, module development, but these are some of the steps that we can benchmark on. And so last but not the least is we evaluate the design and the development process. So here we review the design and the development process against appropriate evaluation criteria. And then we identify best practices and areas for improvement and then prepare an action plan for improvement for future projects. So meaning we can make modules for the first semester and then we can evaluate as we go and then maybe evaluate at the end and then use that evaluation to create um, better modules for the coming semesters, okay? So here we keep in mind that the five steps, they're very, for me, they're very long. There is merit to them, but if I were to suggest, there's just, a very straight to the point approach in developing a, a module, we can use the design thinking approach. Now, if I remember correctly, we did a design thinking um, workshop, I think two, uh, three or four years ago. And it's for me, it's very simple and um, simple in terms of steps. Now, I'm not saying easy, but the steps are easy. I'm sorry, the steps are simple. And because part of our outcome is design thinker, so maybe we can apply that. So. Just, just, um, just to mention it, we, does the design thinking approach go something like this? We start with empathizing with our client, that means our students. But also, I would like to, um, to add to here that when you also design your module, empathize with the teacher. So empathize with yourself. Sometimes you get so carried away um, designing our activities that we later on realize at the end of that, we will be the ones checking all the activities. So also, it's not, it's not a priority, but also empathize with yourself, okay? A happy teacher is a happy class, okay? So make sure that the teacher is also happy. When I say happy, not, uh, not doing anything, but rather that there is a balance to things, no? And also empathize with the university, okay? So we also have to take care of our standards no, in the university. And when we say excellence, when we say greatness, it does not come from the top. No, it always comes from those who are front lines in the classroom. And that means the teachers. So we have to empathize, define okay, what needs to be met, how to meet, etc., etc. Ideate, so meaning all the activities that you can give or, or design to help your students learn and then create your prototype. And then we test the module. If it's working or if it's not, then we have to change. So. That's one approach you know, that we can also follow. So that's the design thinking approach. So 
how far have we come okay so let's take a moment there because that, that, that um, the first few slides were very filled with information so let's take some time to ask you no know, without chatting but just answering from where you are the first question is what is a self-instructional module so i hope you'll be able to answer that second what are the steps for making a self-learning module okay and third how are self-learning modules different from typical textbooks and then the fourth is what challenges do you think will you encounter in writing the self-learning modules so if we were able to answer those questions, then we have more or less met some of the outcomes that we have identified at the start no, of our webinar, except for number four, no, because that is very specific to you. So when you think about challenges, no, what challenges do you think will you encounter in writing self-learning modules? I share, no, let's extend our discussion just a little bit. One of my favorite quotes from an award-winning um, teacher from Ateneo de Manila University, and his quote goes something like this, Ang masakit at mapait ay nagiging kaakit-akit depende sa bakit. Okay? So it's very beautiful, at least for me. You know? So uh, we are not saying that it's easy to write a self-learning module. We are not saying that um, learning Google Classroom will come um, very welcome. Oh, it's a very welcome change, but if we know our why, no, so we have a, we need to go back to our why. If we have a very strong why, then um, the hurdles, the challenges, will take a step back. Okay. So if you notice, my last question are what are the challenges, and then you know, so you start thinking of oh, how many materials you'll need to review, how many hours you have to sit to write, etc. But then if you look at it in the perspective of um, academic continuity, in the perspective of continually assisting our students to learn, no? so assisting our students to achieve their dream of becoming a teacher, becoming a nurse, becoming uh, a journalist, no? a reporter, a, psych uh, a psychologist, no? a physicist, no? a scientist. So, um, somebody who writes literature, for example, who becomes an author, etc. If we look at this struggle in that perspective, then we start making our modules from a stand of inspiration and motivation. So I hope that we can all take inspiration from this as well. So to continue, so I hope you are still doing well wherever you are. So let's take a short break from so many words and look at this picture. Okay, so I'll give you 10 seconds to look at this picture. Okay, so we see here an iceberg immersed and on top we have their design deliverables and then at the bottom we see their design thinking. So as we ask ourselves a question, what does the image tell us about the development of self-learning modules? Okay, so if you go back to that picture, okay, so it reveals to us that the module that we put out is just the tip of the iceberg. It is the preparation behind it that will require so much of our effort. Okay, so I share here a short comic strip. There is boy, there's a boy says, I taught Stripe how to whistle. So this boy was bragging to his friend that he taught his dog how to whistle. And his friend said, I don't hear him whistling. And then the boy said, I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. Okay, so what does this imply? You know, so sometimes we may operate from a stand that this is what's best for my students. This is how they will learn. No, but the test of how effective what we do is always on how our students are able to learn and achieve the learning outcome set for the course, for the degree program, no, or for the class. So, a point of reflection. What skills do you need in order to develop an effective self-learning module? So, in a way, the beautiful thing about accepting that we need to learn certain skills to write an effective self-learning module is that we have to remember that skills can be learned. 
right? So if it's not something you know now, then you have time to learn it, okay? So we operate, there are so many learning theories that you can use and we can all use, but I would just like to highlight the cone of experience, okay? So people generally remember 10% of what they read. This is from um, Edgar Dale. 20% um, of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear, 70% of what they say, and 90% of what they do as they perform a task. So knowing this cone of experience and how much students learn from every experience in a way that we give them, um, I would just like to highlight this idea that learning should be an experience. Therefore, content in itself is not an experience. So when we write our module, just focusing on content, no, I am not saying it is wrong, but rather it may not be the design that we need you know, for, for our goal right now. So we have to keep our eyes on the goal. So content in itself is not an experience. So we have to keep that in mind as we decide the activities that we will give our students. It should be a direct, purposeful experience. So I would like again to highlight not activities for the sake of activities, but rather activities that are meaningful, that they build learning. Okay, so according to um, Ta and Makalde, how do we foster learning through self-learning modules? Number one is we have to identify effective learning outcomes. Second, we use interactive dialogue. And third, we need to have meaningful learning activities. So number one, in effective learning outcomes, I do not wish to spend so much time on this because all of us were trained how to identify learning outcomes. So just a few reminders, it should be student focused. It should focus on abilities central to our discipline. Third, is we focus on aspects of learning that will endure, okay? So I, what will my students take away from this module? If they forget everything else, what will be the one thing that I would like them to remember? And then fourth, we limit to a manageable number of key outcomes that have a realistic chance of being accomplished within a semester. So we have to be very realistic. And then our outcomes have to be smart. Some would say smarter, some would have other meanings for S-M-A-R-T. So I leave that to you. But I don't think, you know, so ju just my knowledge of how educators are in the university, I don't think I have to discuss this portion uh, very thoroughly. Second is just to highlight on when we decide on learning outcomes and we think of content, Minick in 1989 classified materials that may be included in any instructional material as need to know, nice to know, less to know, barely relevant, or might be used someday. So this could be helpful to you. For example, you have so much content that you want to cover, and then you have to ask yourself, which of these do my students really need to know? Right? Which of these not really need, but it's nice to know, right? And then which of these are less nice to know? Then we have barely re relevant and might be used someday, okay? And what do we include in our module are only the items, okay? Only the items that we need to know. So we focus on what our students need to know. Given the um, limitations of our time and our resources, so we have to uh, focus on that, okay? So moving forward, so when we try to identify our learning outcomes, I would just like to share this poem, which I got, which I always share with my students when I teach them lesson planning, and it goes like this. Pretty good, no? by Charles Osgood. There was once a pretty good student who sat in a pretty good class and was taught by a pretty good teacher who always led pretty good paths. He wasn't terrific at reading. He wasn't a whiz-bang at math. But for him, education was leading 
straight down a pretty good path. He didn't find school too exciting, but he wanted to do pretty well. And he did have some trouble with writing and nobody taught him how to spell. When doing arithmetic problems, pretty good was regarded as fine. Five plus five needn't always add up to 10. A pretty good answer was nine. The pretty good class that he sat in was part of a pretty good school. And the student was not an exception. On the contrary, he was the rule. The pretty good school that he went to was in a pretty good town and nobody seemed to notice he could not tell a verb from a noun. The pretty good student, in fact, was part of a pretty good mob. And the first time he knew what he lacked was when he looked for a pretty good job. It was then when he sought a position, he discovered that life could be tough. And he soon had a sneaky suspicion pretty good might not be good enough. The pretty good town in our story was part of a pretty good state, which had pretty good aspirations and prayed for a pretty good faith. There once was a pretty good nation, pretty proud of the greatness it had, which learned much too late that if you want to be great, pretty good is in fact pretty bad, okay? So what could be one of our learning points from this poem is that when we design our effective learning outcomes, it has to make sure that it's not just pretty good. So at the very start, our goal is, of course, greatness. So we inspire greatness from our students, most especially when we model it. So modeling is the most powerful tool that we as teachers can give our students. And since we don't have face-to-face -face classes and we plan to replace ourselves with a self-learning module, then by the manner by which they see the module, they might say, oh, I have a, a really great teacher, also in a way. So and when we determine effective learning outcomes, let's try to always not settle for what is just merely acceptable. No? So we have to really um, inspire greatness you know, in each other. So moving forward, so I'll not dwell on that so much, we go now to interactive dialogue. So initially when I prepared for this webinar, I was told that we've had a series of uh, trainings for self-learning modules. But one of the struggles of um, teachers, or not really teachers, but anybody who wishes to write a self-learning module is how to write in a manner which is interactive. So that's the reason why this webinar is called um, Interactive Module Development because they would, I think um, the organizers would really like to focus on how do we make our modules interactive, okay? So the, um, according to Minnick in 1989, so this is very, a very old book, but um, the ideas are still very much relatable and applicable. So essentially much of our learning, formal, informal, or technical, has in, evolved in a storytelling format. So don't hesitate when you write your module. So our goal here is to become a technical storyteller, okay? So don't hesitate to use phrases that you use in conversation, but usually don't write down. So in writing, so I, I would like to highlight this portion, that we are writing for our learners and not our colleagues, okay? So that's the reason why we sometimes hesitate writing in a conversational format because sometimes when we read it, it, it sounds very basic, right? And say, I don't want to be basic. No, I want to show how much I know about this subject I am teaching. And then I don't want my colleague, for example, no, I'm not saying everyone thinks this way, but we might think I don't want my colleague to read this module and say that, oh, this is just how much he or she knows about this unit. No, so we are not writing for them. We are writing for our learners. So we have to consider the tone, which would be effective to our students. So number one, it has to be informal. So there is a relaxed way of writing, okay? or the, the manner, the tone that you are writing with. Second, it has to be more conversational. So how you um, are, how you speak in conversation, you just write it down. You, know, you try and then you read it and you ask somebody to read it. Okay. Third, there should be you more, no, appropriate you more. So pauses for mental refreshment. Okay. And then we also have questioning. 
which enhances learning by the repetition principle. So you ask a question and then you just repeat it later on just to evoke that thought from your learners. Now, even if you are not there to hear the answer, just the mere um, questioning or the hear, when you, the learner hears the question, he or she will be prompted to think of the answer, even if you are not there to hear it. Next is we have to look at the reward system. So reward system here is not that you give um, a medal or a trophy, but rather you can say congratulations, you have finished the first part of this module. You have now learned how to. So those are some of the things that we can include when we write our self-learning modules. Okay. Remember that some rules of the role, when I say role here, this is the technical storyteller, some rules of the role are to forget your peers and colleagues, okay? They already know the information. They are experts of the information. As you create, you have to pretend that you are the student, okay? So we really have to put ourselves in the position of our students. So one of the things that I can advise that we can all do is if you've never enrolled in an online course, I suggest that you do it, okay? So very recently, I've never, so I would share a personal bias. Before COVID-19, I am not really a believer of online courses. So I have a bias for face-to-face -face delivery, okay? So I, I do not enroll, I'd never thought of enrolling, for example, in an open university because I feel that I will not, I'm, I'm the kind of student that really wants to face my teacher, okay? But understanding the change in the educational landscape, you know, the world will not adjust to us. So the world will not adjust to me. So it is I who have to find it in me to adjust. And so very recently, I enrolled in a course um, with Open, UP Open University. So just to get a feel of, the, of how it is to learn um, online. And I found out that it is very demanding in terms of readings, for example. And then because I work, I have to do it outside office hours. No? So, um, I mean, there needs to be a balance. So this, it has become a very fruitful experience for me, especially that I am considering of making a module for my students in the graduate school. So I have to, so it's different when you have an idea of the challenges of your students and it's very different when you allow yourself to be a student once again. So if you have never done that, there are so many free online courses right now. You try to enroll in one, and then you can have a first-hand experience of the kind of stress that you might be giving your students. So stress is generally not bad, but you know, um, it will help you empathize more. No, I empathize more and there are and as much as I don't believe that er, you're every you're supposed to be liked by all your students no, it's impossible to be liked by all your students but children specifically and in my experience learners they learn more when they like the teacher you know? so I'm not saying that you have to be liked by everyone but when you exercise empathy and when you know when your students know that you care no, even if you demand and even if you give a challenge to them, they will think that it's coming from a genuine place of you wanting them to, be the, to become the best that they can be. So it's a balance of challenge, but then support. And you cannot really give genuine challenge and support if it's been a very long time since you've allowed yourself to be challenged. So again, I go back to just empathizing with our students, especially in this pandemic, okay? So that's for being a technical storyteller. So when we, I will not anymore, the third part is meaningful learning activities. So I will not go um, very specific on what activities you can write because you are the expert no, of your content, you're the expert of your courses, but I would suggest the use of a checklist. Now, for example, when I make an activity, is the purpose clear? Will my students understand why I am asking them to do this, okay? Is the activity relevant? No, especially in this time of pandemic, okay? 
third is the level of difficulty appropriate. Is it not too simple? Is it not too difficult? Okay. Are my instructions clear? So there, are activities varied and interesting? And are activities realistic? And is there a feedback mechanism? So will the students know if they did right or if they did good? So many modules, they put answer keys at the back of the modules, but it depends on the goal of your module and the design that you agreed on, especially if you are team teaching. So I hope that this checklist will assist you, you know, in your choice of activities that have to be meaningful. Okay, so I will just share one activity um, that espouses parallel thinking. So I am a believer of the need of our students to think in a parallel manner, especially in a time of social media, um, spread of fake news and varying um, standpoints. No? So um, I would like, especially in my research class, I always tell them to check their sources first. And then second, um, operate on kindness and respect. Like for example, you don't have to share the views of everyone around you, but that shouldn't stop you from respecting you know, their right to believe in what they believe in. So something like that, something to that effect. So parallel thinking, which is something you can consider when you write meaningful learning activities. So its essence is that individuals of a group look or think in the same direction, all points in time to allow the brain to maximize its sensitivity in different directions at different times. So for example, is this story, or I think this is a parable of um, the elephant. I, I forgot the, who wrote it, but I heard it being shared. And I shared to you, with, to you today that there was a group of people who was um, observing, say observing an elephant from different directions. And then somebody asked, um, describe the elephant or describe what it is you are holding or touching or what is in front of you. No? So, and then depending on where they are around the elephant, they answer differently. So it's a fan. It's, I remember my class in uh, Philosocial Foundations, I think it was a story of the, the table. Like um, how you describe the table will depend on where you are sitting. But it doesn't mean that when you describe it differently that it's wrong. No? It just is affected by your perspective. So to answer or to exercise parallel thinking, one of the ways is to use Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. So I use this in my class and I enjoy using this. So you might consider this one that when you wear a white hat, you're supposed to be very objective, fact-finding. When you use a red hat, you're supposed to just let your emotions dictate your thoughts. Third is black hat. This is the hat that is most vigilant and we look for what could go wrong, okay? Then the yellow hat is the optimistic hat. What could go right? The green hat is the most creative. Uh, how can we address this problem if we think outside the box? And then we have the blue hat, which collects or manages the entire thinking and puts them together. So one activity that I do is like for example this is this happens uh, in my class so this might change the design might change if i put it in a module so maybe i can put a table and then i can ask them to wear different hats so if you're wearing a white hat so the the, the situation goes something like this you and your companions has ju have just arrived um survived a crash of a small plane both the pilot and the co-pilot were killed in the crash you're all dressed in city clothes, appropriate for a business meeting. Your group of survivors managed to salvage the following items. So there are many items there. So if you are just asked to bring three, what three items would you bring? And your answer has to be dictated by a hat. So for example, if you're wearing the white hat, if you are very objective, what three things will you bring? If you're wearing the red hat and you're very emotional, what three things would you bring? If you're wearing a black hat and you're very pessimistic, what three things would you bring? And then if you're wearing a yellow hat and you're very optimistic, what three things would you bring? And so on and so forth. So this exercise of thinking 
no, can be applied in a very in various courses. Okay, so it could be applied when you do principles of teaching. It can be applied in looking at learning, uh, teaching learning principles, etc., or even in classroom management. So these are just maybe an additional input that you can consider when you design a meaningful activity. Okay, so now we go to the very practical aspects of this. So when we did a training with Simeo, they would um, really espouse the idea of using four A's. So I am not um, saying that we should use the four A's, but I'm just sharing one way that we can be doing the writing of the module. So the four A's, for those who are not familiar with it, it starts with um, activity and then analysis abstraction and then application. So when I was still a student in the university, my teacher, so my professor in the principles of teaching, Dr. Cabal Quinto, would really, would taught us to reimagine the five A's and she added a, another A in front, before the activity and she suggested that we include awareness just to prepare the students. So um, in my, in the module that I created, I used the five, the reimagined five A's and then um, adjusted the design of the module according to that. And again, these are things that I think you already know, but allow me to just go through them. One, is, and one is apply. Second is we start with the familiar, start with the students are. Third, talk to the learner in a friendly and encouraging dialogue. Four, ask reflective or rhetorical questions. So of course, this is a module, so you can ask rhetorical questions because they don't have to answer you out loud. Fifth, relate content to the learner's experience, um, experiences, okay? Then we have context and then give lots of examples. I have, in my many years of teaching, my students really love examples. Then reinforce, praise, encourage our learners so they don't give up, okay? Then we have provide a bridge from one topic to another. So if you see a module, sometimes the next section starts by saying, um, you have just finished a chapter, uh, the, the activity on, so it, it connects from one section to the other, okay? Or when it's a new topic, you can refer to the previous one, the previous unit talked about, and now you, you are going to learn how to, so it applies the just out psychology. There's a more wholeness you know, in the way that you present the, the, the lesson or the topic. Nine, use language that is closer to everyday conversation. Closer, but not exactly. No, I, I will not suggest that you use the words that our very young learners use now, no? like char, etc. No, So I'm not saying that, no? but it is, when I say everyday conversation, it means that it is relaxing, it's informal. It's like um, the student having a conversation with his or her teacher. Then we keep our sentences short, not more than 20 words. 11, exercise sensitivity to groups and cultures, okay? And number 12, we use active rather than passive statements. So changes were made by us. In, uh, instead of saying that, we say, we made the changes. Instead of saying, the food was prepared by the students, we say, the students prepared the food, okay? So those are just the guidelines. So some resources, that I personally use, no, and I think I still have time, I will share some of the resources that I personally use when I design uh, my modules or my presentations. Number one is we have free designs in Canva. So never, if you've never used Canva, you can start using or exploring it tonight or when you have time. Second is that there are free PowerPoint designs in Slides Carnival. So those are all free resources, okay? So you can use that. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation that I am using, I got this from Slides Carnival. And then third, I will also share with you, maybe you can use uh, speech recognition, okay? So um, there are many teachers who are finding it difficult to write in a conversational manner. So I would suggest that you Pretend you're giving a lecture and then you allow your laptop to write it and then you read and then you you just review yourself but uh, you just check on yourself so very quickly I will share so this is Canva so if you it's just canva.com and you can just search in Google Canva then click templates there's education here there's lesson plan worksheets certificates storyboard bookmark 
class schedule. If you want to create a very nice Zoom background, you can design it here. Concept map, mind map. So these are just some. You can make your own logo, business card. You can make your own invitation. For example, if Dr. Garcia will get married, then he can design his own wedding invitation here. So there are so many things that you can use and it's all free. But of course, some of the templates you have to pay for. No? But you can just choose to just um, use the free templates. Okay? So I'll just give you one example. I searched book covers. So you can design book covers here. So here in my example, I am writing. So there, I, my example later on is a unit on um, introduction to research. So I designed a cover for that. So I just look for a design and the design is like this. I place there Sibonarma University College of Teacher Education, a self-learning module on the introduction to research, and then my name. And then it looks very nice. So I am not a very creative person, so I am not very good in the arts, so I need all the help I can get. And when I need help, I go to Canva. And then after you design it, you just download it, and then you can use it. So that's Canva. Here, this is Slides Carnival. These are all free, very nice, PowerPoint presentations. Okay, so uh, here Slides Carnival, then you choose. There are all templates, color, inspirational, formal, simple, elegant. So you don't, um, like what, what was said out yesterday during the Google Classroom, you don't have to do it from scratch. You know, there are so many resources from the internet that you can use and they're all free. You just have to learn where to look. And also if there's something you don't know, you can just search a uh, tutorial from YouTube, for example, and then it's just right there. So here in the slides carnival, so when I chose a PowerPoint um, template, like for example, this one I am using, it, this is how it looks like when I downloaded this. So see, it, it has around 30, I thought 29 slides, and it has already the formatting of, for example, if I am to give a quote, this is the slide I will use. If I'm going to give a big concept, this is the slide I will use. If I will show a map, this is the slide I will use. And then if I need to use um, um, a picture of a cell phone, I will use this slide. So it's not just one slide, it gives you 29 slides. And, and all you have to do is edit it. So it, it's very good, it's very um, helpful to you. And when you're done with the slides, you upload it in your Google Classroom, and then you are good to go. So here, but this time I would like to share this feature which may be present in your laptop but you have not discovered yet, which could help you write um, a self-learning module. The feature is called self-recognition, sorry, it's not self-recognition, it's called speech recognition. So if you're using, um, uh, an, I'm not, um, because I'm using um, an Apple OS, so, if you're using Microsoft Office software for Windows, Windows OS, I will suggest that you look for this tutorial in YouTube. And then here, I recorded a very short tutorial. Um, so this is for those using a Mac. Okay, so if your OS is Apple. So I will just play. So if you're using Apple, then you click on System Preferences. So that's where you find it. And then under system references, you look for your keyboard. So when you click keyboard, there is a dictation option, a folder there for dictation or a tab for dictation. Check if your dictation uh, function is on. So you click the on uh, if it's turned off and then you take note of the shortcut for the, this feature. So in my case, my shortcut function is pressing the function button or the function key twice. So that's how I use the, the dictation button or the dictation function. However, I can also access it in uh, one of the tabs for um, Word using the start dictation in the edit menu. So when my dictation option is turned on, all I have to do is open a new document. So here is a document. So I'm enlarging it so you will see it more clearly. Bigger font size so you will have a better appreciation for it. Then I will click um, edit and then I will say start dictation. So when I click start dictation, now a microphone will come out and whenever I say something, 
my microphone, my word will write it for me. So, 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 so for example, I'm, when I recorded it, I spoke different things. And I, you can just delete it. So, for example, I will really write something for my modules. I will say, say, for example, there are many definitions of research as there are those who define it, period. And then it writes the period. So, if you, this, this will help you write a more conversational uh, text for your module. So, you can check if it's not dictation, it's um, speech recognition. So, it's not perfect. So, for example, many experience the feeling of anxiety. And then it records as nanny experience. So if it makes a mistake, then you just correct it. No, so marong mangali ang word. No, marong sada. So it's okay. You just edit it. So there, if the nanny is wrong, you just edit many experience. And then for anxiety, you just edit anxiety. There. So this might be helpful to you if you're finding it difficult to write in a conversational manner. You just speak in a conversation and then you let your laptop write it for you. No? So that's, I, I hope this one would also be helpful to you when you start writing your module. Okay. So I hope that uh, those examples will really help you answer the question of how do we write effective um, self-learning modules. So we keep in mind that writing effective self-learning modules will require teachers to become technical storytellers with the ability to identify effective learning outcomes, which I think you can do, use interactive dialogue, which all of us have the skill to be able to do, and design meaningful learning activities, okay? So how far have we come? How do we know that learning outcomes are effective? Okay, so those are things that we can answer. What skills do I need to acquire in order to become a better storyteller? Okay, third, how can we ensure that our choice of activities for the self-learning modules are effective? So much of teaching, I was taught by my teachers, especially for Dr. Cabal Quinto, um, that teaching really involves the art of questioning. So much of teaching involves just asking the right questions, not the very effective questions. And then let's walk the extra mile. No? So just thinking about Writing, self-learning modules, you think kapoy, and then, you know, Google Classroom, kapoy kaayo, and then deadlines, kapoy jud kaayo, no? But, when we think about our students, and I always tell them this, na ajoy kapoy na worth it. So, kapoy mo trabaho, kapoy sadang walay trabaho, no? Mas kapoy ang walay swildo. So, we are very grateful that we have a job and that we are paid and we are in a university that really assists us, no? Assists us in in um, delivering uh, what we need to deliver no so there are so many kapoy things in the world no so but I hope you choose the kapoy that is worth it okay so allow me at this juncture to pause in my presentation and share a sample module that I created okay so here is a sample module I created this I think uh, two three years ago so this one is for introduction to research. I don't know if this is uh, visible to you. So here is, but this one, when we design this one, this is not for full online or full remote teaching. This was designed for blended learning. No? So, um, so there, there might be some things here which may not be applicable if it's totally remote learning, but um, it's not perfect, but I would like to share how I did the module. So the model of overview, um, there are many definitions of research as there are those who define it. What many students do share in common is the feeling that comes at the mention of the word research. Many people experience the feeling of anxiety and to a certain extent fear. Your previous experiences may not have been rewarding or you may have preconceived notions on what research is that may have contributed to this impression. However, this module it is, is designed to not only guide you as you take on the world of research, but to help you see that the skills needed for this academic endeavor is equally useful to your daily life. To aid in your learning, this module is divided into five parts. So actually, these five parts are inspired by the five A's, but I have changed it no, so that it becomes more friendly. 
to my students, or at least I believe it is more friendly. So I say learning compass. Uh, it's, I, I hope it sounds familiar because I also use it in my presentation. So this portion orients you with the learning outcome. So if you notice the way I've written it, I always say orients, orients you. So when you read it, it feels like I'm talking to you. Then let's begin. After the identification of learning outcomes for every unit, you will be given a task that leads you to the key concepts that will be discussed in the unit. Then when we're on our way, is the activity will be followed by guide questions that will lead you to the concepts covered by the lessons. Here, you will analyze what you have done. And then let's dig deeper. Key concepts are discussed in the section of the unit. These are things that you need to think about and reflect on. So in the end, there is a big idea which is highlighted. So I, I have big ideas. And then how far we've gone. So this is to check whether we have met our learning outcomes and the students are given a task to assess the extent of their understanding. And then the last is to walk the extra mile. So um, I said five A's. So there's one, two, three, four, five. You're supposed to stop in application, but I firmly believe that one of the key um, things that we have to consider for learning to be lasting, it is, has to, to extend more, uh, to everyday life, you know, to, to make sure that our students find meaning in our lessons, not just for the course, for the degree program, but for life. So I end by saying, in a nutshell, research is the search for truth. May the truth you help unravel lead to more meaningful and fulfilling discoveries. May your academic undertakings help people and societies reach their full potential. And then I say, welcome to this adventure. So I say welcome to this adventure because I use Compass, let's begin, we're on our way. So you can choose your own uh, theme, whatever it is that you like. So for my unit one, see how specific the content is. It's just one content, it's just the nature and the characteristics of research, but I have invested a whole unit to it. So here is, here are my objectives. So here, let's begin. So please try answering it. I don't know if you'll find meaning in it, but here, the search for truth. Below are five thought-provoking statements. Identify which of the following is true by placing a check on the space before the number. So I made these examples many years ago, but now in on if I think about this one, maybe you can put here five um, headlines. And then you ask your students to identify which of which they think is a fake news or not, uh, or is a real news. So here, actually, my point here is not for the students to know which one is the truth or which is not the truth, but rather if we look at we're on our way, my question becomes, what did you do in order to identify whether the statement is true or not? So some of the students might say, I did nothing, I just, answered. Uh, so see, that's very critical. So many of our students right now, they click, they like, they love, they share without doing anything to check whether it's true or not. So that right there is already a learning moment. Okay, so we capture all the learning moments that we can. And then to proceed, all statements are actually facts. So all of the statements are true. Um, see? And then we go back, all of them, even the favorite color of former President Corazon Aquino is red. No? So, of course, before I wrote that down, I checked if there, there is really evidence that would uh, prove that all of the statements are facts. But my point here is not just the facts for the facts itself. I have here a question. All the statements are facts. Some of these can be confirmed through a simple search in the internet, but there are also statements here that have been subject to a debate for a long period of time. And then, have you ever encountered an interesting piece of information or event which you found unusual or difficult to understand? And how did you make sense of what it is you have been confronted with? And then I lead them to what a phenomenon is. So an interesting fact or event that can be observed and studied. So my jumping point for teaching research is the identification of a phenomenon. It has to be interesting, it has to be observable, it has to be something difficult to explain at the onset. So I will not bore you anymore with my learning tasks. So here, I will just go then. 
there's a portion when I really discuss. Now, this is all content for the let, let, let's dig deeper. So here's an example. My, one of my activities is Think Pair Share, which is not possible if it's full remote. So there, I, I can correct myself. That one is not appropriate for a self-instructional model module. Then here, we have the content. So I will just move through it. So of course, I define certain concepts. And then at the end, if all things they will forget, I will ha want them to just remember this one thing, that research is a systematic, controlled, empirical, critical investigation of hypothetical propos propositions about the presumed relations among natural phenomena. That's the definition from Kerlinger. Then we answer, how far have we gone? So what makes research different from other methods of understanding phenomenon? So the idea here is supposedly that you ask questions that they will not be able to answer just by searching from the internet, okay? But I think we can all agree that sometimes you also need knowledge questions just to springboard, you know, that checking if we have met the learning outcomes. So there is this one. And then we do applications. So I wrote here an example of an abstract of a research that which was done by my students before. And then I asked them, what phenomenon is studied? So this is application, no, I, I like to believe. No, so they have to look at that and then see uh, what is the phenomenon here? And then what question are the researchers trying to answer? So without even discussing the parts of the research, I am slowly introducing to them these concepts so that at the next chapter, I'll just introduce the name of the concept, but they will have an idea of what the concept is. And then we ask, why is the phenomenon worthy of study? Okay, why well, is this a phenomenon worthy of study? Because when they propose a topic, I will always ask them, why is this worthy of study? And in what manner does it show systems and controls? In what manner is it empirical? And in what manner is it self-correcting? And when they answer this, I will tell them that when they present their proposals, these are the same answers that I will ask them. Where are your system for, what, where are your measures for system and control in your paper? Where is your source of empirical data? And where is the self-correcting measure for this paper? And then we always walk the extra mile. Going back to the research article given in the learning task above, what is the message of the article to you as a future teacher? And then experience is the best teacher. Would you agree or disagree with this statement and then support your answer? Now for this sample, I prepared an answer key. So here. Answer key meaning it is not just the answer, but rather the number of points that I will give when a specific, um, you know, I would say this is the rubrics of when I give a full three points. So the three points is given when the answer mentions the following. Okay, when it lacks something else, then I give two and one. So if I attach this to my module, it is to imply that I want my students to check their own work. If I don't attach this, then that means I may have a system of asking them to submit their work and then I will be the one to rate them. So it really depends on you and the choice of your design. So here, purposes of research and why is important. So here in the important, I do not give the exact answer, but I will say there are varied answers for this question, but what can be highlighted is that it is natural for man to try to understand the world around him and that's recognizing the limitations of experience and reasoning because how we understand the world is it's primarily experience and reasoning, but these two are not enough you know, so to help explain phenomena. So it allows us to recognize the value of scientific research for truth, which is research. So here I have my answer key. Okay, so I hope you are still there. I would like to just share, I have I made this, I think, last night, so I am not yet finished, but I will try to finish this today before I send it out. I wrote a self-learning module on writing a self-learning module. So for the module in, uh, overview, you will see here that the, what I said a while ago are just the things that I wrote. So this module has been designed to guide you to create effective self-learning modules. The presence and spread of coronavirus disease has caused unprecedented disruptions economically, socially, politically. And then um, there is just a short discussion here. So here, this creates the need for the production of self-learning kits. So in a way, what I said, I just placed in this module. The parts are the same. And then the end, I say, we hope that this tool, or I hope that this, this tool helps you become the teacher your students need in this time of pandemic. 
Then I have here my learning compass and my let's begin. So actually what I asked you to do a while ago, that's the first part. You have to read the paragraph and then the questions, how are the paragraphs similar? How are they different? Which paragraph do you think is a self-learning module? Support your answer. So don't forget to write support your answer because sometimes the students will just say, which paragraph do you think? And it's an A, and then they will just write A. So they will not explain. So make sure that you write clear instructions no? because our students are also uh, doctors of philosophy. So there, support your answer. Then when our, we're on our way. So considering the sample paragraphs, what do you think is a self-learning module? So that's the third, I think third part, uh, second part of my module. And then for let's dig deeper, I, I just gave, gave the content, but then there is still conversation here because I said, now is the time to check if your answers in the previous sections are correct. So here, what is a self-learning module? And then maybe here, before I introduce, so this is not just definition. If you see here, this is the definition, but I included my discussion here. This tells us that there are limitations in terms of coverage when learning kits are used. So this one is already mine. So when you discuss, you just put there your discussion here. So for example, in this section, before, no, this, this, um, even in research, you're not supposed to start a table right away after a section subheading. No? So, for example, we put a discussion here. And then I will show you, I will just use, and I hope that this is clear to you, I will start, um, for, I will start dictation. I hope it works. So you can understand better the characteristics, oh, sorry, it will not ask. So you can understand better the characteristics or attributes of self-learning modules, comma, the table below differentiates it from a typical textbook, which you are familiar of, period. Okay, there. So, so like, sorry, the, the, even the, the computer recorded my okay. So I just showed you how, for example, you can just say it and then your laptop will write it for you. No? So of course you have to edit a few points. Maybe you can put a dash there. I don't know why it's blue or it's wrong again. So I don't know how, maybe that. Then you can just check and then just moving forward. Here, my keep in mind. And then how do we design? And then, and I would like to just highlight this section here. You can be, you can make, you can design your module so that it's not your um, remote. So you can say, mom, for example, what if my topic is very complicated? Or for example, my discussion here needs more additional resources. So you can say to understand these steps better, you can watch my recorded lecture on the topic in our Google Classroom, our shared Google Drive, or in my YouTube channel. So I know some of the teachers here have YouTube channels already. I will just not mention who. And then, but also, if your students have no access to the internet, you can send the module with an audio recording. So you record the audio, you use the recorder on your phone, save as MP3, and then you say, you listen to this audio. So they can listen to it on their phone or their computer without the use of internet connection. So it just feels so much effort no? because you have to record, etc., etc. But remember, again, the highlight, the point here is that you're trying to replace yourself. So the, I think it's uh, plus points to you if you work so hard to replace yourself. That means you are very, very valuable and difficult to replace. So there, keep in mind, and then I included it here, and then how far have we gone? So my questions a while ago, and then I just placed spaces. And then here. Create an action plan for a proposed creation of a self-learning module by identifying specific activities for every step. So first step, what are your activities? Second step, what are your activities? And then what challenges, etc. And then walk the extra mile. So if you remember a while ago, I said, Dr. Onofre R. Pagsanghan, an award-winning educator from Ateneo de Manila once said, Sorry, ang masakit at mapait ay nagiging kaakit-akit depende sa bakit. So reflecting on the challenges you anticipate as you design and develop a learning module, what inspiration can we draw from Dr. Pagsanghan? So that, that's it. And then my references. So I will just stop there. So I will send to you um, 
these things after I finish them. And then hopefully um, this will also be useful to you, okay? So just to end my presentation, I ended here. These are my references. So my presentation template is from Slides Carnival. My photos are from Unsplash. And as I end my, my talk, so I hope that I will just say that I hope that you learned something from this webinar. And um, allow me to say that it has been a great honor and privilege to be asked to, to share my thoughts on the self um, um, self learning module no and um so I, I hope that because i'm this is the first time i'm doing it and i would like to really take this opportunity to honor all my teachers who are listening right now so i will not be the teacher today without all of you and i hope i make you proud and this is my way of thanking the university for everything that it has given me so i will just share this picture this is as far as i can remember so I studied in CNU for kindergarten to elementary to college for my master's and for my doctorate. So I'm not sure if you can see me there, but this is my big thank you to the university for making me the teacher that I am today. And so I hope that you learn something and that it will truly be helpful to you, especially in this very challenging time. So thank you very much for listening.